Hi, it's Splinterverse. Welcome to another episode of D&D New Releases, where we offer first impressions of new third-party products for Dungeons & Dragons. We cover a selection of titles from Dungeon Masters Guild and Drive Through RPG each week. The titles are presented in alphabetical order, and all of them are linked in the video description. Purchasing the books using those links helps the channel, but you can also support us by purchasing one of our best-selling books. Our newest release, Dragonlance Companion, offers 180 pages for players and DMs to bring the magical world of Kryn to life. And like many of our books, it's available in hardcover and digital format. Our Swarms of the Multiverse offers over 70 brand new creatures, including their associated swarms, instructions on how to make your own balanced swarms, and lots of bonus materials such as four new demiplanes. Our Feywild Companion offers 150 pages of Feywild fun for players and DMs alike. Also, our book, Fizzband's Vault of Draconic Secrets, contains over 50 pages of dragon-themed player options, including a subclass for each class and much more. We've got lineages suitable for any setting, as well as optional lineage rules in our Van Richten's Librem of Lineages. With our Potions Unlocked book, we have over 100 pages of material to take potions to the next level in your game. Please support the channel by purchasing our books using the links in the video description. Before we get started, a couple announcements. Um, one, I'm sick, but I want to make sure I do this video. A lot of people enjoy it, and it's some of the only promotion a lot of these creators get, so I don't want to let anybody down. So I'm going to power through it with you today. The other thing I wanted to let you know is that the GM's Day sale is going on right now on both the DMs Guild and the drive through RPG. As you can see here on screen, it's one bookshelf's biggest sale of the year. So up to 30% off on over 70,000 titles. So now is a great time to get books off your wish list, etc. So if you can click one of our links and shop the sale, that'll help the channel and help the creators that you support with your purchases. Um, as I said, it's on both sites. So I hope you take advantage of it before it ends. All right, our first new release is D20 Magical, Weird and Wonderful Magical Books from Vertigris Table and Ryan Doyle. It's on sale for a dollar. It's normally a dollar ninety nine. It's 28 pages. And it says the more knowledge the characters and the players have access to, the better equipped they are to make informed decisions and understand the stakes and consequences of their actions. These mag magical books create opportunities for the heroes to learn more about the world around them, while generating more roleplay opportunities. Many GMs look for opportunities to further develop and share the lore they built with their players. These books can do just that, and in a way that the players will enjoy and look forward to, encouraging them to seek out even more knowledge about the worlds they are exploring. Beyond the 20 magic items delivered in a mobile-friendly, shareable manner, there is a printable-friendly format which doubles as a roll table. So you get, and then you get two bonus books, which are a bit more powerful and may make the others redundant. Two bonus books, meaning two book items, right? This is a book with a printer friendly version as well, right? Um, they behave a bit differently and can be held back, modified, or embellished to suit the GM's needs and preferences. And then uh, Vertigris Table has a YouTube channel you should check out and a Patreon and all that fun stuff. Um, and so the formatting in this book is, is cool because it, 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 it's meant to work with your phone so you can have the item just on your phone and easy to look at reference in the middle of the game or of course you can use it on your your uh, desktop computer as well so we get to see the whole book which is always nice uh, in the preview so I'm just gonna read a few of the books so you can get a taste so the very first one is the all-natural almanac brimming with information about plants beasts and other natural phenomena this book can share what it knows once per day in a slow affable manner that is often drawn out in appreciation of the subject's beauty and most impressive qualities which occasionally borders on poetry granting advantage on nature intelligence checks so yeah, you could have a lot of fun with that. I mean, the personality of this book is 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 that it's going to just be um, extra, 
you know, it's going to give you that extra exposition as it, as it tells you about something. So, um, you know, you could be just asking, you know, what's, what's the weather this time of year in this area? And it, you know, it gives you this, this huge, long winding explanation. And you're like, Oh, I don't know if I want to ask this book anything again, but it could be humorous, right? It could be fun. It could be even a way to fill some time, uh, maybe you're waiting for some players to show up or somebody's going to the bathroom, whatever, you know, you could you could really embellish and and, you know, as the DM portray this book in a fun way. So I like that. It's a good one to start with. Um, so you got the Directory of Contacts, the Codex Arcanum, the Diviner's Compendium, uh, the Dossier, uh, Dossier of Danger, the Echid. Chiridion of the Extra Planner. That looks interesting. It says, though presented as fairy tales as told by a child, this book can deliver insightful information about nearly any aberration, celestial, elemental, fae, or fiend. The book's knowledge only comes at the beginning of a long rest, either as a tale told beside a fire or as a bedtime story. So you don't have to role play what's happening with these books. You can have it um, at the beginning of the rest that you're getting knowledge about whatever it is. Oh, I'm learning about aberrations or I'm learning about elementals or you could you know if you're really into it you could come up with a little fairy tale you can even ask your player to do it you know say hey here's some pieces of information about an elemental um, are you interested in coming up with the little short story or something that this 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 uh, childlike narrator is going to share um, from your book and uh, that way everybody can hear it as just a fun little kickoff to the session today or whatever right so number of opportunities cool so let's look at one more Some explorer's guide to the wilds the frugal wizard's grimoire let's just scroll all the way to the end because there was some talk of some extra powerful ones um so we'll, yeah, so here's the, the table at the end. So you can print this, it's printer friendly, no color ink wasted. Um, so let's look at the last one, the Inquirer's Oracle. It is unknown what form of magic, extra planar beings, or the spirit of some long forgotten wizard powers this book, but it certainly seems to operate in its own good time. Practically any query written under the pages of this book will be answered in time, though often days or even weeks later. That's awesome, I love that one. Um, <laughs> cause you could really make that respond at the worst time or, you know, after the fact, you know, like, like, um, maybe the big bad has a weakness to, to, um, fire damage or something. <laughs> and you ask the book, you know, what's the, what's the weakness that, you know, what's a weakness that the big bad has and you write it in the pages and it's, it's like a week goes by and nothing's happened. Then you slay the big bad and while you're standing there looking at the loot, the book pipes up and, you know, it, it, it may, whatever, it makes a sound or it, it starts reading what it says. You know, maybe it reads what it says and it says, the master is terrified of fire or something like that. And you're like, oh, well, thank you so much. A little too late with that, you know, and it could just be a really fun, almost an NPC. And you could really have fun with your players because you're going to have to ask them to populate the pages of this book you know if they want to get the value out of it they're going to have to put something on the paper so the fact that it takes time is also really smart design here because that gives the dm the opportunity to say i'm not even going to respond to this till next session so i can think about what that response is going to be or you can be like oh perfect now i can you know they ask this question i'm going to answer it you know later today in the session whatever right um, so lots of flexibility and smart design in that one. I love that. And I mean, this is a dollar, right? You're getting 20 um, books and um, uh, really fun format, easy to read. I love the ideas in here. Um, and so I think you should grab it. It's under D20 Weird and Wonderful Books in the links below. Give it a click. Next, we have Dungeon Vault Magazine, issue 31 uh, from Elvin Tower. And this issue has uh, contributions by Kevin Heloc and Vile Nest, and uh, it includes 10 original adventures and high resolution maps as well as VTT versions. So um, I love this series. Um, it's just packed with stuff, 
and in this case it's 695 for 55 pages so you're getting 55 pages of adventures and what i absolutely love about this particular issue is it's giving you adventures for tier one through tier three so you could even make whole campaigns out of this um and just the maps alone to me with elven tower are always worth the 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 entry price so you know 695 you're gonna get all these these uh, maps and um i mean just scrolling through looking at them the reusability of the maps in elven tower is always great too like you could reuse this uh you know sort of temple with uh with an exterior or you know whatever this is it looks like a you know it could be a dungeon it could be a temple it could be um a crypt right you could reuse this map over and over um, for different sessions, different situations, as well as the adventure that it was put here for, right? So many, many options. Um, you get to see 30 of the 55 pages here, and you can see in the table of contents, so Broken Hook's Hideout is a tier one dungeon crawl, um, tier two for Taint in the Family, and um, you just go through it up here, Gathering the Magic is tier three, so multiple things you can string together to create a campaign or just use as one shots. So um, very, very helpful. Um, so very, very cool, interesting. And each of them usually is, is quite creative. So we've got Broken Hooks Hideout here. And I'm just going to scroll. Let me zoom out so you can just see the beautiful layout, all the different maps, and you're, you're getting them in the page, but you're getting them as files too, so um, that's really helpful. Here's something called the Ambulatory Artery, so it's a tier one monster. Um, you've got the, the Sticky Hair Troll, it's a CR7 uh, monster for you. So these books are always packed with stuff. Uh, here's the Silver Trail Finder. Um, you've got just so many things. The Circles in the Lava. Is, is the name of another one of these um, gathering the magic you know this is very reminiscent of magic the gathering right so let's look at that one let's zoom in here it says no one can replicate the ancient magic crafted by the primordial elves dragons and giants the few surviving artifacts from that period possess such power that nothing can explain how they came to be a historically obscure, obscure period thousands of years ago, the demise of all the bygone creatures and soul forgers, scholars of today squander their lives trying to recreate the marvels of the past without success. One of them is the fabled deck of many things. Uh, so, you know, that's an in-world game of cards, you know, or not really a game of cards, but a deck of cards that, that is powerful, right? So it's appropriate for a Magic the Gathering inspired adventure. Um, so it talks about more about the background of it. Um, so the characters find out from a trusted source that a powerful magic item is close to resurfacing. It is a magical deck of cards fashioned by elves from a bygone era. Rumor has it an evil organization has gathered some of the cards. The characters may also learn in the Drunk Deer Tavern of the strange spawning of shape-shifting creatures that points to the location of the missing cards. So that's just one hook that they're giving you to draw them into this adventure to deal with the deck of many things another one is a secretive cult that calls themselves the gathering grows in strength as they collect more cards of the deck of many things its leader uses the jester card as a focus for powerful magic and summoning spells the cult slayer is located in an ancient elvish tomb where they found five of the missing deck cards the cult has attacked nearby settlements to ascertain their claim on nearby lands and to collect resources eliciting a response from the crown they offer three thousand silver pieces for stopping the cult on its tracks and there's a whole rumors table which is good um yeah i mean that could be that could be really fun and then here you have uh, the drunk deer tavern you get the the mimics there's some mimics involved you get the cultists um some events that happen there and then you know it just goes through the the full adventure you get the flavor text the map um so this looks like it's the tavern the drunk deer and then um, you got a development here. They learn important information for their mission in the Drunk Deer Tavern. They socialize with locals and, may, locals and may even take on a side quest or two. Regardless of the adventure hook that led the characters here, they learn the following information. And it lists um, things like the cultists slowly take on more territory as they grow in power. Merchants that were robbed claim that the cultists were asking for divination and playing cards. Right? So... Um, 
they're on to these <laughs> they're on to the the cultists a little bit they're gonna have to um you know find all as many of the cards as they can right and i like that this is focused on they've got just a few of the cards right so you can play with that and figure out which cards they've got and uh yeah there's some flexibility with all of that i mean as usual they kill it at alvin tower so much information that you can reuse i mean you can reuse this drunk deer tavern there's other encounters that can be had there not just this adventure so you can really build up to this like you could get you know them doing things in this tavern and in this area and then the, the first time they hear about a card or something or maybe they find a card and so now they've got a card and the cult is of course looking for the card so what happens next do they they use their card to fight back against uh the cultists are they a target of the cultists now i mean there's so many ways to go about this because the deck of many things has a lot of cards it's more than 52 i believe so um, and that's just one adventure. There's 10 in this book. As I said, so much to be had here with artwork. I mean, look at that map. That map is epic. Um, and stat blocks and monsters and, and tier one to three and VTT. And I mean, it's all here, folks, for $6.95. Check it out. It's under Dungeon Vault Magazine 31 in the links below. Give it a click. Next, we have the Nine Tombs of Athel Carr complete it's a mega dungeons setting and it's from grinning rat publications fifteen dollars it's it's for osr or um, dungeoneering uh, it looks like uh which is uh, you know an osr system agnostic um you know play set and uh it's this is 60 pages and the author is nate whittington and it's cool that it's both a mega dungeon and a setting. So Dungeoneers will find themselves exploring two distinct but connected locations, the wilderness of the barren lands and the subterranean dungeon-like underworld. While it is structured for use with the Dungeoneering rule set, it is system agnostic and would fit in any system with minor tweaks. Uh, so you get various factions vying for control over both the barren lands and the underground realms of the underworld. New creatures, spells, prayers, and magic items ranging from humble potions and scrolls to the ancient storied blades of the nine champions. Interconnected places and mysteries that inspire exploration and inquisitiveness. So, fun stuff, and I love the cover. It's so cool. Um, so, it shows you, you know, this. it's got a gazetteer, including wilderness locations, and then you get right into the mega dungeon with eight levels, and then... Um, there's a section a level actually nine because it's got quietus at, at level nine and then the appendix has monsters treasure magic items spells and prayers so quite a lot packed into the 60 pages um we'll read a little bit here for you in a second but i just want to scroll so you can kind of see um, how cool the layout looks really easy to read it's very printer friendly as well um, you're not going to waste a ton of ink printing this um but yeah i really like this let's let's zoom in here so one of the hooks is collecting on the bounty of sweet of all the bandit lords in the barren land sweet is one of the most notorious having the smallest of the gangs has not stopped sweet's meteoric rise to power over his little cut of the wasteland the party has been sent by an authority to put an end to the bandit lords operation in the barren lands and bring sweet to justice in the nine realms to make matters complicated it is imperative to set authority that he makes it back alive so yeah that could be a fun way to get the characters into the dungeon. Um, you know, they're, especially since the party is going to have some authority to what they're doing. Um, you know, they're going to be able to say, look, you know, we're here on official business, so you better cooperate. Um, and then you got the nine blades that says the elfin sword masters with their unnaturally long lives and even longer memories have sent a demand to the lords of the nine realms. The blades wielded by the forgotten champions must be returned to the elf lands at once every warrior has heard tales of the elfin myrmidon a fearsome predator on the battlefield who makes ghosts of men and how a single elf can take on five score human fighters alone the lords of the nine realm has sent the party to the barren lands to find the blades and return them before war between the elves and men erupts so and then it says the party begins at the kobold burrow so where whichever hook you use you might start at a different location but that's cool Myrmidon, um, and you know, the Lords of the Nine Realms. That's cool too. Um, 
fun stuff, fun connections to some lore here. Um, and then you've got a whole section on connections to the underworld. This is the Kobold Burrows are a series of connected caverns and tunnels that cross into the Warring Warrens. Um, and then you've got some ruins, an ancient Orcish town lost to time, holds forgotten passageways that connect directly to the Omulshad royal ruins. I love you getting nine connections to the underworld. So um, you're going to pretty much fall into it if you're in this area adventuring. So that's good. Um, and then you've got wilderness locations. And look at look at how cool this is. You get um, sort of the overview and then um, it says roll D, 1d6 where, to see where they go. Um, so it says the burrow of the ant, the burrow of the shaman, um, when they go through a stair. And then it gives you, like, okay, the information. So food stores, stinking food stuff within which lies a fattened wriggling corpse beetle. Tomb cave, plundered tomb cave containing smashed painted hydria. Among the broken pottery is a silver ring worth 10 GP. Ant statue, a burnished deactivated bronze statue in the shape of a giant ant, lies in urt. So a number of things. And, and you know, it, it gives you opportunities to pick where they start with this rolling. Or you can just decide, okay, they're going to start in the burrow of the dragon or whatever, right? Um, and then it goes through each of those areas with plenty of maps here to help you see what's up. But, yeah, I mean, this is a mega dungeon for sure. You've got all, so much stuff in here. I like how many options are in here. That's really cool because, you know, a lot of times you get like three options, right? They're giving you like nine and ten and all of that here um, with really fun artwork and a fun concept. Uh, so I liked everything that I read, and I hope you give it a chance. Look for it in the video description links. It's under Nine Tombs of Athalkar. Give it a click. Next, we have Reach for the Stars by Greg Marks and Kobold Press, and it's $4.99 for 18 pages, and it says the stars are in your grasp. Step aboard your skyship and head out into the realms between worlds. Reach for the Stars provides a full bag of options to enhance your 5th edition game that ventures out into space between the stars. So, you know, it wasn't that long ago that the Spelljammer 5th edition set came out from Wizards of the Coast, and so this is an entry from Kobold of the Cobalt Press that 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 connects to it, right? So you can use this stuff with your spell jammer setting or independently. That's why I love it, and they do so many cool little supplements from from Cobalt Press. They have their big hard covers, right? Um, and their Kickstarters, which are fun. I have I have a lot of their stuff. It's 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 so good, but these are cool because they're they're very small little focused supplements that really deep dive into a topic. And um, this one has four new spaceborne materials, so you can make armor and weapons with cool new properties. You get nine new spells. It says, ply the stars with more verve and grace. Three new elemental monsters, from the void elemental to the nubuli. Uh, new player character ancestries, including, including the nubuli, the microgravity dwarf, and the warp breed orc. Tables for adventure generation to keep busy GM stock with ideas. And that's not even everything. Jam every spell into your bag and head out into the Celestial Spears for Spaceborn Adventure. So I love this. It's it's such cool. And I mean, look at this artwork. How could you go wrong with this? I mean, that is just so cool. Um, you can just see that they're sort of flying through wild space or whatever space you want to make it. And um, they're, they're having a battle on the Spelljammer ship or whatever you want to make it. <laughs> Again, it doesn't have to be... Spelljammer, but I'm just saying it's cool that you can tie it into that. So it says, not every GM comes ready with over-the-top ideas to insert space battles and aliens into their game, so here's a few idea-generating tables. Start by rolling on the Adventure Seed table. Adventure Seeds give you the general idea for a plot for your adventure. Each entry contains capitalized words. Each capitalized word points to a corresponding table afterward. Choose from or roll on the appropriate table to fill out the specifics for your Adventure Seed. You can also use any given table to flesh out any other aspects of a space themed adventure so this is really going to help you because wild space is vast right you're going to need ideas and um with these tables you can just roll and let it tell you what you know kind of ideas or you can just you know put your finger on the table and just kind of read up and down and, and pick one 
um, however you want to go about it, this is going to inspire you to create something because it's not going to do everything for you, but it's going to give you a framework for an adventure in wild space or whatever space, right? Um, that's where I live, whatever space, right? <laughs> um, especially while I'm sick. Anyway, um, so you've got this D6 table here, which is where you start. It gives you the seeds of the adventure. And as it said, the, the capitalized um, tables are where you go next. So we're going to just pretend we're rolling a six on this. We get space race hunt and since the characters participate in an annual event race to the location and back or to hunt some rare uh, alien animal at the location. So they have to race to it and back or they hunt some rare alien animal. Um, while there's bound to be danger, the biggest threat is an NPC participating in the race who will cheat by eliminating the competition or sabotaging their ship. So that could be a lot of fun to play with too, like dealing with this NPC and sabotaging and doing weird stuff um, while they're while they're trying to accomplish their main mission. They got to keep an eye on this NPC. So it says, you know, the characters participate in an annual event race to the location. So now location was capitalized. So we go to this next table. And we let's say we roll an eight. And it says alien planet, a totally alien planet with an unusual ecosystem. Is there water, poisonous atmosphere, dangerous flora and fauna? So they're racing to this alien planet. And um, it says there's an alien animal at the location, ra some rare alien animal that they're gonna have to hunt there if if they're if the if the story goes in that direction, right? So now let's figure out what this NPC is that's gonna sabotage. Thing. So let's pretend that we roll a five. So it's di Diplomat. The Diplomat has a mission and is looking for that negotiating edge to help them complete it. They prefer to avoid violence. So if I was trying to write this adventure based on what we know so far, they've got to race to an alien planet to get this rare alien animal. Maybe this Diplomat is in, in some sort of political situation and they and they they know that if this this animal is found and whatever they're looking for on it is successful that the leverage that this diplomat has for whatever political no negotiations is, is going to be diminished and so they want to keep their power so they're trying to sabotage this you know they 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 join because supposedly they want to you know oversee things make sure things go as planned because this is very important to whatever you know society that you want to imagine that this is all happening as part of uh, maybe it's realm space or it's grin space or, or you know midgard space and you have them with you you think they're on board they're helping you but they're secretly sabotaging maybe they have uh, you know some sort of hangers on that also are helping sabotage and uh you you find out what that is and you say okay I get it. You you know this is you know whatever this alien thing is, we bring back its claw, and then your rival is now going to have the last piece of the puzzle that your rival needs to put together this magical thing, and then therefore they'll have more power, and then you're going to be diminished, and yada yada, right? <laughs> so that's just what we're coming up with live. We're doing it live, and uh, <laughs> so it just shows you how fun this could be just picking stuff so there's also a MacGuffin table like um it says rather than a magic sword or crystal ball fantasy adventures in space often use magitech hybrids or strange alien substances so you can have a lost ship a unique kind of ship powered by an unusual helm you can have a doomsday device a device capable of massive devastation on a regional planetary or system scale like maybe even destroy a whole space like it could threaten one of those spaces i mentioned earlier you know so fun stuff and i mean we're just scratching the surface we're only seeing four of the 18 pages so i'm definitely adding this to my wish list um i i actually just bought a number of these supplements uh, from cobalt press as part of the gm's day sale going on right now because they're marked down and and the a number i had had my eye on like the ratatosk and um the, there's a moon one that's really fun that i've been wanting that i talked about on the show so Anyway, I find so many good ones for myself through the show, so hopefully you are too. Anyway, great stuff. Good job, Greg, and Cobalt Press, as usual. I love it. So I hope you check it out. It's under Reach for the Stars in the links below. Give it a click. Next, we have Splinters of Faith by Gary Schotter and Jeff Harkness and Frog God Games. And, of course, anything with Splinters in the name 
I'm going to be a fan of being Splinterverse. <laughs> so very cool uh, cover as well. I mean, look at this. This lady on this on this uh, this dragon seems to be having a good old time traveling that way. I you know I'd love to have a dragon that I can ride too. I guess so. Very cool. Um, and it says it is thirty four ninety nine. But you can also get the soft cover standard color for $49.99 or the hard cover standard color for $59.99. Um, but then you can combine things and uh, there's there's bundles where you get the hard cover or the soft cover along with uh, the PDF. So uh, you can do that for $51.99 or $61.99. In any case, this is a massive, massive book. 524 pages that's that's awesome and it's rare i mean I, I look at books every week we're almost to our 100th episode and it's rare you don't it's you see 300 you see 200 pretty often you see 150 100 pretty often and of course anything lower than that very often but 524 pages i mean that's that's just beyond beyond big um, it says, visit 11 temples and a massive adventure to halt a death priest and his massing army. And it's a series of 11 linked adventures centered on stopping the return of the dread death priest, Akriel Rathamon, and his undead minions. The campaign takes characters across hundreds of miles as they race to different temples to restore the broken scepter of faiths, a powerful weapon that once stopped the warlord. It all starts when some chickens go missing, but this foul beginning might mean a foul ending for your characters. I love that. Well, that that is not a trope. Having it, you know, chickens go missing, trigger everything is not a trope. So bravo, Gary and Jeff, for not starting with a trope. I love that. <laughs> now I'm really intrigued. I got to get this book. Uh, it's it's it starts when chickens go missing so cool and you know this was published more than 10 years ago uh, but this has been updated and expanded with bonus adventures color artwork revised maps and deadlier monsters and then entire adventures have even been rewritten or expanded for a new audience and and they were originally separate adventures not connected so now they've been tied together which i think is really cool i mean if you've had 10 years to think about this stuff and really like look at it with a different lens i mean speaking as a writer myself you really need sometimes some separation from what you've written to see the true things that you need to change or that could benefit from some alterations um, there's there's a number of techniques we use with Splinterverse Media Books to 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 replicate that since we don't always have the time uh, that we'd like. You know, we don't have ten years to wait. But I love when people do stuff like this, where they go back and revisit and lovingly craft a, a revised version of something because there's going to be people that played this ten years ago or or sooner and are just like whoa I, I i remember that it was fun and they can it's going to be a whole new experience for them because it's been redone it's been reworked and there's new pictures and artwork and and um, you know expansions and changes and it's going to be fun for somebody who's run this before to run it now as either a big campaign or even just parts of it and see all the changes that have occurred so i mean the cover is just amazing uh, but let's look inside we haven't even looked inside so you've got fifth or sixteen chapters, and then your appendices have NPCs, monsters, magic items, deities, ghostly abilities, hauntings, player handouts, etc. Um, and then you get the author's introduction, and uh, it started with the chicken. I love that so much. It says the first Splinters of Faith adventure uh, from 2010, and an updated version published in 2021. How cool is that? Um, yeah. And um, it says Splinters of Faith campaign. The Splinters of Faith campaign is a series of linked adventures that starts with a few chickens going missing and eventually leads to a deadly confrontation with a reawakened death priest. Again, these chickens go missing. And it's like, oh, gosh, got to find these damn chickens. And then the next thing you know, you're dealing with a reawakened death priest. 
I mean, I don't know about you, but I think I'd just let the chick chickens go, right? We could find some more chickens. <laughs> but I, I love that because that's not what you expect. Um, you know, one of my greatest writing teachers always used to say, you know, into what life has this story come? And, and, the, and the concept of that was what was interrupted by the story. So somebody was dealing with these chickens and then they went missing. And so that was interrupted. And now the story is unfolding. And so it's, a, it's again, I love that they went against the tropes and they started with something just mundane almost. Definitely mundane, I guess. Um, so it says the death priest Akriel Rathanan rose to power in 613 Imperial record during the Age of Silence as he built this fledgling empire around the sprawling jungle city of Al Safan. Fear reigned in the seething jungle of Libnos, Libinos as Akriel's forces marched outward and overthrew nations and cities in a spreading circle around his burgeoning city state, forcibly bringing more people under his banner in an ever widening gyre of destruction. Bloodshed marked Acreo's rise to power as he forced a single deity upon those he conquered, Oricus, a god of death and rebirth of the soul. The death priest forced all those he conquered to worship Oricus, and human sacrifice became commonplace in the growing empire, with those who refused to follow the new god's beliefs often ending up being their first the first one sacrificed. Under Acreo's iron fist, Oricus's power grew as more people most unwillingly began worshipping the dark being, dark cults to Oricus flourished in the dark corners of even the noblest cities, and sacrificial worship spilled blood in the wake of Ocreo's march to power. So clearly a bad person, um, Acreo. And, um, you know, you've got Oricus, which I, sounds like an interesting uh, deity as well, because um, it's growing in power and it demands human sacrifice or, or um, you know, other bad things. And so um, I love that background. It shows this whole timeline here. Um, through the imperial record um, so this is going to form the backbone of these adventures this whole history of um, you know what is happening but the authors say do what you want these adventures are meant to be versatile if you don't want to send the characters on an epic quest to restore the scepters of faith then don't use the individual adventures in your home campaign as you see fit don't like the scepter face? Change it to something more appropriate for your campaign world. It could just as easily be the sword of face, the axe of faith, or the sickle, sickle of faiths. Um, whatever, whatever you want. So it's nice of them to include this sideboard to remind you. You know, it's when you engage a product for Dungeons and Dragons or even other games, Pathfinder, OSR, etc. It's really up to you. You're you're as the DM, the arbiter. Of what's allowed what's not um, you're crafting the the sort of overarching narrative yes your players have certain dominions over you know their their character and you know their character story but that sort of setting and the the what you're gonna try to accomplish is is under your control so what's beautiful about a book like this beyond all the things that we've talked about today is that there's all these 10, 11, sorry, 11 adventures in here. And you can run just one of them. You can run all 11. You can run five of them and then divert and go somewhere else. Whatever you want to do, you've got options. But most of all, I hope you find these darn chickens <laughs> and get them back to where they belong so that the world can be right. Um, although it doesn't sound like it's going to be that simple. Um, I love it so much and it's going to go on my wish list. I, and I, you know, I have to support it with a title like this. So, um, I would anyway, it's, it's a great one. So I hope you check it out. It's awesome that it has all these, these options too. Uh, hardcover, softcover, PDF. So look for it in the video description links under Splinters of Faith and give it a click. Next we have World of Terror Intel Sanguinarian Volume 1 from Urge. And it's $4.99 for 15 pages. It says, this issue's focus is on the powerful Sanguinarian faction. It features lore for this faction in the World of Terror Intel campaign setting. The Battle Fury Ranger subclass, the Shambler race option, several magic items, blood magic spells, and the harrowing behemoth monster. Um, they've worked very hard creating something that they feel 
brings multiple interesting options for players and game masters and they hope you enjoy it so there's they have a youtube channel down here i think it's called urge tv so you can check it out give them a subscription and um you know this looks really fun because it's it's really a grab bag of many different things i mean don't be turned off by the fact that it's number two right you don't have to have necessarily number one because this is really meant to pick and choose the different things that you you might want so maybe you want the subclass or the race or some of the magic items or the spells and you know with books like this you know you might use everything right away but what i i like to think of them as is almost like an armory so you put the stuff in there and then you pull the things out as needed right so you know right away you might use the blood magic spells and then in a future session you need the harrowing behemoth and then the shambler race for a new campaign or whatever right so think of it as stocking the shelves of your armory or or whatever um you would call it in there i don't know if it's shelves per se but looking here you get the the lore so if you want to use the setting that they're building up to at urge um, you have that option but remember most things you can take out of the setting and homebrew you know their connection to your world so you got the ranger subclass the shambler race the magic item spells monsters etc um so right away we're getting into magic in the veins so we're going to get a little bit of background here um on the sanguinarian um there's you know and there's also a faction involved so it's, it's cool to hear about that so it says Tarantal and the Forerunners. In the mysterious world of Tarantal, the history of the past civilization is fragmented. Certain cultural aspects have been pieced together from the few relics that survived the conflagration and the chaos before the awakening. One such detail is the strong connection that the Forerunners had with the innate magic of Terror and Tal. So deep was their bond that it was one of the major factors that brought about the destruction of that era. The ancients harnessed innate magic and became bound with it in their blood. The greed for power and convenience continues into the post-awakening age. So right off the bat, you're finding out some history of Tarantal and um, the Forerunners. So the Forerunners are going to be important to the lore here. But again, you can separate the lore. We're just looking at the lore because that's what's in the preview, right? But, but keep in mind... If you don't want to use the lore, it's okay. Uh, blood magic comes with a price to pay, and it does not come cheap. The bloodlust can quickly overtake a new sanguinarian, leading to an untimely end. The user can enhance focus and physical prowess by drawing on the blood magic within. It can also be manifested into spells and other unnatural means. Harnessing the blood of an enemy can create weaknesses and openings for attacks. There are also methods of initiating a bloody frenzy that bonds the user and the enemy together in a duel to the death. So it's fun that they have blood magic in here. Um, you know, there's, you know, lots of historical uh, lore for, you know, in the real world for blood magic. There's also many works of fiction that have used it. So to get to have it in, in the game that we love is, is exciting um, as well. So it says, in the Sanguinarian faction, there is dichotomy. Some seek to use their power for domination. Others choose to use it for the protection of the weak. Between these two groups lies a division inside the faction, and there is sev severe hostility among these rivals. On the one hand, there is a desire to annihilate one's enemies entirely. It is not enough for a straightforward victory. The opposition must be destroyed entirely and used to strengthen their power further. This group often lends itself toward conquest and tyranny, though some more moderate followers seek only to destroy enemies to enhance their abilities and care little for dominion more broadly. On the other hand, the more cautious sanguinarians practice this dangerous magic only when it benefits others, such as on hunting trips to feed their families or in defense of their homes. Others in this group prefer never to use their power unless absolutely necessary. Many tribes and villages rely heavily on this magic and would otherwise be extinguished. In these cases, the sanguinarians are considered by many people to be heroes and protectors. So it's an interesting faction, the sanguinarians, because there's conflict within. A lot of times with factions, you just have that external conflict with, with another faction. But here, the, the authors have wisely given you 
internal conflict. So you can do some politics, you can do some intrigue, some diplomacy, whatever you want to do. You can put the characters inside this, in the middle of this, right? So the characters need to be in the middle of the story. So you could put them in a really difficult position where they have to make a choice. Um, and uh, by by putting this conflict within this body of the Sanguinarian faction, it, it really opens up lots of story possibilities. So I love that. And that's just a sneak peek. That's that's all we're seeing here. We're not. We haven't even gotten to look at the race, the subclass, the magic items, the the spells, the harrowing behemoth. I mean, there's a lot in these 15 pages. So I hope you give it a look and consider purchasing it and supporting Urge as they 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 start creating all this cool stuff for World of Terror in Tall. Uh, you know, as always, we want to keep encouraging these creators to put put stuff out there and one way to do that is to purchase their stuff follow them on social media uh leave comments and reviews on their stuff so check this one out it's under world of tear and tall 2 sanguinarian in the links below give it a click well that was our last new release for one of the sites before we move on to the second site a few announcements for you first of all please subscribe to the channel like the video and leave us a comment. All those things help us get the word out. More people find the videos and get to know about all these great releases if you can do that. And I'll respond to all comments personally. If you can click those links in the video description and support all these awesome creators that we featured this week, that really helps them. This business is tough, so you want to help encourage them to stay in it and creating these awesome titles for you to enjoy and bring to your table. And if you click any of those links and make a purchase, even if we didn't talk about it today, it's going to help support the channel through a small affiliate fee. So we really appreciate it when you do your shopping with us. That's awesome. And if you really want to take it to the next level, to support us you can purchase one of our books you can go to splinterverse.com to read more about all of those or click the links in the video description in the section we have on our books and i'll just tell you about a few of them here now so our latest one is the dragonlance companion it's 180 pages for dms and players to really get into crin everything from subclasses to races including classic ones like draconians and half ogres and thanoi as well as two full-blown adventures, a tier one and a tier two that you can link together for a full campaign. We've got monsters, magic items, encounters, new types of items like legacy items, and even herald items that are connected to the gods, which we profile in massive detail so that you can use the piety system to really interact with the gods. So there's just so much to be found in there for Dragonlance and Kryn if you if you're into that or if you want to take these things and put them in another setting of course and it's available in print as hardcover or digital or you can get both for this uh, combo price uh, where there's no extra charge for the digital so that's that's always very cool then we've also got swarms of the multiverse which is over 180 pages dedicated to brand new monsters that have some sort of connection to swarms whether it's uh, they form swarms they they summon swarms or they control swarms each of the 70 new monsters in this book have some sort of connection and we give them lots of space in the book each monster gets a minimum of two pages so you get lots of lore you get tactics you get a playlist of the moves that they would use on their on their stat block so if you want to quickly run it without reading too much you can just go through the playlist we've also got associated things like uh, magic items that are connected to some of the creatures demi planes full demi planes uh, that you can explore with some of these creatures as well then we've got rules for you to create your own swarms that are balanced for 50 edition so that's really helpful and then we have other types of swarms like environmental swarms that don't even have hit points but are more like hazards or puzzles that your your party will have to pass through to, on their way to whatever the next adventure is so tons and tons of stuff to really bring swarms to life and help you make a swarm out of any creature whether it's third party or an official wizards release you'll be able to confidently make those swarms using those balanced rules and again it's print or digital 
Then we've also got our platinum bestsellers here with the Feywild Companion, which is over 150 pages devoted to the Feywild, the 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 plane where everything is fey and it's really a fun place to explore it's a little bit different than the material plane so you you can have a really unique experience that that kind of turns things on its head and it this fits well with wild beyond the witch slide or any other uh fey experience that you want to have it's got player uh, subclasses one for each class that connects to the fey it's got magic items races lineages uh, it's even got trinkets, a new type of item called Flowers of the Feywild, which is a new consumable that helps you really feel like you've gone to a fantastical place. But these these flowers can be used as a consumable item or like an environmental hazard, which is fun. We've got a brand new Domain of Delight with a beautifully illustrated map in the same style as the one in Wild Beyond the Witchlight for Prismere. We've got full adventures, encounters, monsters. I mean, it's just jam-packed. VTT tokens, all that stuff if you buy the digital, but it's also available in print as well. So you're going to want to check that out. Then there's also our other platinum bestseller, Fizban's Vault of Draconic Secrets. Uh, it's it's devoted to dragons. It's meant to tie into Fizban's Treasury of Dragons, but it can be used on its own. So you've got dragon-themed subclasses, one for each class. You've got trinkets. You've got magic items you've got horde magic items draconic gifts so those things that are in fizz bands we're expanding and giving you more so you have more draconic gifts and more horde magic items you get a brand new familiar adventure hooks to tie everything together from the dm point of view so you can make those subclasses npcs or whatever you want to do so it's really really good it's going to be a hardcover soon so uh by the time you watch this it might already be a hardcover so you can you can get the hardcover and or the digital as well then we've got our Van Richten's Librem of Lineages, uh, which is devoted to the new concept of lineages that was introduced in Van Richten's uh, Guide to Ravenloft. And it, it's it's really fun. It makes your race basically something very personal to you because lineages are something that is sort of thrust upon your character. It's not how you were born. It's an experience that you've, you've, you've gone through and it's changed you. And so these are very conflict-driven lineages suitable for any setting, not just Ravenloft. Got four of those in there. And then we've got optional rules on how to string those together so you can go from one lineage to the next or you can remove a lineage if there's some reason you want to go back to the original race or just for story purposes you want to remove it you have that option with this book and then we've we've got potions unlocked which is print or digital and it's over 100 pages and it's really devoted to taking uh, potions which are kind of a run of, mill, of the mill thing where you just say oh i'm going to take a healing potion oh i'm going to take a healing potion and make them fun again it's got it's got optional rules for taste smell uh overdosing on these potions how to craft the potions even with the 30 new potions in here with with really cool artwork we've gone and given you really in-depth origin stories for each of them that you can have a vendor relate to the players or you can turn it into an encounter if you want to have the players be responsible for the creation of some of these potions we even have potion themed locations including a potion shop with two different stories and a whole um a whole set of maps so you can go to each of the layers of the of the potion shop different vendors that are profiled with full inventory lists a school where you can learn to craft potions and experience various encounters and adventures and then we've got magical plants and things that you can you can craft uh, you know harvest and craft your potions with so tons and tons of stuff the whole point of the potions unlocked or any of the unlocked titles that we're going to do is to really take something and take it to its limit give you everything you could ever want to be the authority on that topic almost and and you know just really deep dive our swarms book is the same thing it's anything you could ever want on swarms so if you're getting these books we feel like you're going to have everything you could ever ask for for that topic and and that's our goal for you because we really want the money to go as far as it can because we we do try to keep our prices reasonable and then by giving you everything we can we're helping you uh have that for for far into the future you're going to have those ability to the ability to you know have potions or swarms or whatever our topic is uh come to your aid at your table so we hope you'll support us and check out all these awesome titles feel free to ask questions in the comments or anywhere if, if you're interested and, and unsure uh, i'm always here to help you but 
no matter what, I hope you're clicking links, supporting creators, whether it's us or the others out there, because this is an awesome industry. We're so proud to be part of the TTRPG space, and uh, we appreciate you. So now let's move on to the other site and their new releases. Our first Steam Skill title is 187 Questions to Build Your Character Backstory. You can create deeper backstories and credible characters to bring your roleplay to the next level. It's by MZ Conti. It's 270 for 13 pages. And it says, Having a great character backstory is important for a role-playing game as it helps to give the player a sense of identity and purpose, as well as adding depth to the character's motivations. It can also help to inform the choices that the player makes during the game, making them more meaningful and relevant to the story. Having an interesting backstory can also make the game more immersive, allowing players to become more invested in their characters. So, a bunch of questions in this book. You can find out about your birth, your childhood, what it's like in your present day situation, your relationships, your faith and beliefs, your likes, your preferences. I mean, this covers a lot of stuff to help you flesh out your character. So looking inside, you know, it starts right here with your birth. So it says, who were your parents? What were their names? What race were they? What were their professions? So, you know, answering these questions is really going to give you that backstory that you need. Maybe your DM wants you to write up a backstory. Maybe you just want to uh, have a backstory to, to draw upon as you're playing. Maybe you're creating a published adventure, and so you're creating a character, and you want to answer some of these questions uh, so that the character has sort of more dimensions than just a one-dimensional character, right? So these can be useful even to write a novel. Um, so I always like prompts like this. They, I think they spark the imagination, get, get your mind moving. It says, uh, do you have any other family besides your parents and siblings? Who are they? Are they relevant to your parents? Um, you know, even actors will ask themselves similar questions when they're building a character for a movie or a play, especially with a play, because you, you have sort of a set amount of information. And so filling in everything um, that led you to this moment is, is helpful. So we get to see some more questions here on childhood. Uh, it says, under what circumstances did you grow up? So your answer to that might be, you know, extreme poverty. It could be as part of nobility. It could be somewhere in between. It could be um, maybe you were raised by wolves. I mean, there's, there's so many um, possibilities to answer these questions. The only limit is really your imagination. It says, were you obedient? Why? Um, did you did you like to learn? Were you good a good student? So you know those are fun questions. You know the basic questions of like where did you grow up and who were your parents? I mean you see those a lot, but they're going really in depth here and asking you some questions like were you obedient to your parents? Basically, um, did you attribute motherly and fatherly figures to someone else? Who and why? Um, so that could be a story. Maybe y your parents died when you were young, and so you had to live with a relative or or a mentor of some kind right um, and that can really inform your backstory especially if you feel like your subclass or your class is one that you could have been trained on so maybe whoever you went to live with maybe it was even like almost like a little orphanage slash training center right so i really like things like this because it can be fun and this is something you can do on your own so for $2.70, you can take this book and just really have a good time triggering your imagination, developing these stories. And again, remember, this is going to help you flesh out characters for your, your table, but also NPCs, also novels, also acting, right? There's so many places you can use these questions. So I think $2.70 is a worthy investment for that. So check it out. It's in the video description links under 187 questions to build your character backstory. Give it a click. Next, we have Deep Dive Troglodytes, and it's suggested price of $217 for 32 pages, and it's by Filbert Scribbles. 
It says uh, it offers an in-depth look at troglodytes, the stinky inhabitants of the Underdark. Uh, it includes everything a dungeon master might need to feature troglodytes in their next adventure. So you get 20 brand new stat blocks, revised lore, racial traits for players who wish to play as a troglodyte, four original troglodyte organizations and societies, including adventure hooks, tactical tips to help the dungeon masters use these new creatures in combat without any problems, and suggestions on how to replace troglodytes where they appear in official adventures. So, and it's part of a series where they're deep diving into specific species or monster from the history of D&D. So, troglodytes are, are, you know, old school. They've been around a long time. It says here, it says they're a staple of Dungeons & Dragons. They've been in the game since its beginnings. They're inextricably associated with caverns and the Underdark being among its most iconic inhabitants. That being said, their most recent iteration doesn't go very in-depth. The Monster Manual contains only one troglodyte stat block, and they haven't been substantially expanded upon since then for 5th edition. They can be made into a simple encounter for players traveling through a cavern, but giving them a larger role in a campaign would take a lot of hard work from the Dungeon Master, but this this supplement is going to do that for you. So um, you've got you've got the overview, you know, sort of the lore, backstory, etc. You get the racial traits, and then you get monsters and adventure ideas. So a nice, well-rounded assortment of troglodyte stuff. So talks about their their history. We'll look at that in a minute. But then you get down here into the racial traits, and you know, you have dark vision, sunlight sensitivity. But they have uh, chameleon skin. It says you are proficient in the stealth skill. Furthermore, when you are in a specific environment, your skin gradually changes color to match that of your surroundings. After an hour spent in the same environment, your skin acquires a coloration suitable for camouflage, and you have advantage on stealth checks made to hide until your surroundings shift in coloration or pattern. So that could be helpful, especially in the Underdark. Um, it's also got stench. As a bonus action, you can secrete a smelly oil that, that creates an unbearable stench until the beginning of your next turn. Any creature other than a troglodyte that begins their turn within five feet of you must succeed on a con saving throw or be poisoned until the beginning of their next turn. You can use a trait, this trait a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus and you regain all of them on your uh, long rest. And then it increases at fifth level, so you can uh, choose one of the following effects. So a creature poisoned by this trait is blinded. So that could be, you could add acrid vapors to cause that. You could do creeping cloud, the radius of the stench, incre stench increases. Um, you could do extreme stench, a creature immune to the poison condition can be, become poisoned due to this trait but they have advantage on their saving throw against it. And then you also have persisting sickness, a creature that fails their saving throw is poisoned for one minute. At the end of each of their turns, a poisoned creature can repeat their saving throw, ending the effect on a success. So cool stuff, seems appropriate. Um, there's other things, but I'll, I'll let you, I don't wanna read the whole race. I want you to come here and read some of it on your own. Um, and again, this is pay what you want, so you could even pay zero dollars, see if it's going to work for you, then come back and pay. But I always recommend paying something. Um, and you do get to see a good amount here without paying for it, so um, maybe also just read through this. But it says, most scholars agree that troglodytes are the relatives of other reptilian humanoid species, such as lizard folk and yuanti. However, the precise nature of the link that binds these different races is hotly debated. For their part, troglodytes seldom care that the origin of their race is unknown. What matters to them is that they exist here and now. Wherever they came from, troglodytes have now spread widely throughout the material plate. They are found in all continents and latitudes, though they live almost exclusively underground, be it deep in the underdark or in caverns and grottoes near the surface. And they often have very complicated relationships with neighboring societies. So that's great, you know, giving you the options to pull them out of the underdark maybe they're just in a cave maybe they're just in a little cavern network um maybe even in a dungeon right if it's deep enough uh for them so fun fun stuff i like it i like bringing back classic stuff uh to the game for fifth edition so check it out so under deep dive troglodytes in the links below give it a click next we have the druid's apprentice part two 
14 worldly new spells from John Beardify. Suggested price is $6.31. It doesn't say how many pages, but um, uh, we'll, we'll look at it. Uh, it says, Welcome, weary student of the natural world. Within this tome, you will find magic that reflects the incredible power of the seasons and cycles of nature. These spells allow you to intoxicate your foes with pheromones, disappear in a swirl of leaves, and choke your enemies with an endless gust of flower petals. At higher levels, you'll be able to seize control of elemental spells, decompose the dead, and manipulate your foe's desires. So this is perfect for a GM who, who wants to give their druid play, players some new magic options. So, sounds fun. Uh, you can see six pages here, which all have quite a few spells on them, so we'll just pick some, some random ones to talk about. Um, so you've got Impaling Vines, which is a second level spell. It's a range of 30 feet, instantaneous, costs one action. Three long razor sharp vines burst from your hand at targets within range. You choose one target or several. Make a ranged spell attack for each vine. On a hit, a target takes 1d12 piercing damage. If the target is a creature, it must also make a strength saving throw for the first uh, the first time a vine hits it, on a failure, you can pull it up to 20 feet closer to you and cause it to fall prone. And then at higher levels, um, you can have an additional vine for each slot um, above third. But what I'm unclear on is, is it says you can choose one target or several. So I'm, I'm not sure what the default targets are. Um, it could be two, maybe that's what several means. And then, or maybe that's a reference to the higher levels. Um, but yeah, it looks like could be fun. Uh, Fairmoon Cloud, first level enchantment, one action, range of self, instantaneous. You secrete an aura of intoxicating spores as part of casting the spell. Choose a creature type, such as dragons or humanoids. Each creature of the chosen type within ten feet of you must make a Wisdom saving throw. Each creature that fails is charmed by you until the end of your next turn, or until it takes damage. While charmed, a creature is also incapacitated. And then you've got um, Cloak of Leaves, uh, first level conjuration, bonus action, self instantaneous. You surround yourself with swirling autumn leaves. You are heavily obscured until the start of your next turn. While you are heavily obscured by this spell, attack rolls against you are made with disadvantage and you can't be targeted by spells or effects that require a creature to see you. So that could be really helpful. Get, get some um, obscurement going when you need it. Uh, yeah, and the visual of the leaves sort of cloaking you could be could be really cool, especially for a druid. So some fun stuff in here. Pay what you want uh, under Druid's Apprentice. Look for it in the links below and give it a click. Next, we have Encounters in the Forgotten Realms by CZ RPG and a whole host of authors, including Christian Zook, as as I L Ulbrinter, Cassandra McDonald, Gabriel Kerr, Caleb Ains, and more. Um, and it's $34.99 for the 332 PDF, page PDF, or you can go with the hardcover uh, premium color book for $89.99 or the standard color for $59.99, or you can pay those same prices and get the bundle of, of the book, the hardcover, uh, or, or um, sorry, hardcover and PDF. <laughs> um, I told you in the beginning, I'm, I'm not feeling well, so... But the show must go on. I want to make sure we get the word out about these awesome books. And this one looks really cool. I love the picture because you can kind of see how it's going to look as a, as a, as a print-on-demand. So uh, really cool. And, you know, print-on-demands are rare on DMs Guild. I think there's like 50-some. So very collectible. If you see a print-on-demand book on here, I think it's a good investment because, you know, eventually... How many copies of these will be out there? Not as many as as you would expect. So so having one in your collection could be could be a valuable investment in my eyes. Um, anyway, this book brings you a multitude of detailed encounters that will help you fill gaps left by Forgotten Realms modules, as well as complement the content for some regions of the most popular D and D setting. It's heavily supported by artwork and maps to inspire you and fuel your imagination even further. These were previously released in smaller digital books, but they've been merged into a single book available in both printed and digital, and the content has been 
proofread again to make it the best quality possible. So these are improvements. If you got the older ones, you know, they've 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 added to them, they put them together, you know, improve the 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 flow and um, added artwork and maps and stuff. So I, I do think it's worth it, especially since the other ones are probably not print on demand. So definitely worth um, you know upgrading it if you already have the digital. So you can see it looks really cool. The layout's really nice. Um, yeah, I like and look at how cool it looks on the desk. Very fun. It's a thick one. There's a lot of a lot of stuff in this book. Uh, yeah, 332 pages. That's that's big. Um, so fun stuff. Let's let's look inside. So you can see you have encounters in Chult, encounters in the Feywild, encounters in Icewind Dale, Icewind Dale expanded, deeper descent into Avernus, encounters in Candlekeep, Queen's Horde expanded, encounters in the Underdark. So what I also love about this is is how connected they are to a lot of the the published material from from Wizards because in my eyes you can never have enough stuff to go along with the official books if you plan on running any of them. Um, or maybe you don't want to run those. You still want to go to Faerun with your, your players. And so this book is another way to do it. Either way, I think this is a great investment because uh, you're going to have so many um, options here. Maybe you don't want to play the, the official modules, but you want to go to Faerun. And then later you decide you want to play the official modules with a different you know table of people, right? So having this on hand gives you either option and... Um, you know, maybe you want to mix it up. Maybe you're a professional DM. Maybe you're playing these same adventures over and over. And, you know, you want to mix in some of these. So it, it, it seems a little different. Or maybe you have a player that's playing it the second time. And they're trying not to do spoilers for the other players or their character. And you can surprise them by having some of these encounters uh, take the place of some of the official stuff as well. So you see the the uh, table contents, everything's nicely laid out. It looks like it's it's um, quite comprehensive because you've got the intro, the encounters, and the expanded ones. And I like that they're separated by location, which which correlates to the published books as well. You know, so so that's helpful. You know, Rhyme of the Frost Maiden for Icewind Dale, and 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 uh, Wild Beyond the Witchlight for Encounters in Feywild, etc. Although again, you don't have to use these with that so just keep that in mind um so very good job in terms of dovetailing these into the adventures so you get a nice forward from ed greenwood and um then you get the the introduction and it goes right into how the book came to life an overview of all the things you, you can expect it gives you the region of where each of the adventures are um, and then the corresponding module. So, so it doesn't say Wild Beyond the Witchlight here for Encounters of the Feywild, which makes sense because the Feywild is like its whole thing, right? But you could connect it to Wild Beyond the Witchlight. Um, so fun stuff. This is this Cholt? So Encounters in Cholt. We're going to look at that. Um, but let me just zoom out real quick and just show you. You're getting to see 80 pages. 80 pages. Look at how much art. I mean, just in that quick scroll through, how much art is in here um, for you to enjoy as you um, peruse the book, even just for inspiration. I mean, having all this art. Um, yeah, I mean, I would definitely recommend going for the hardcover plus the PDF because then you can display some of the artwork and it's, it's no extra charge to get the PDF, which I always, if you're a publisher out there, that is to me the way to go because yes it's tempting to charge more for the pdf but i think it gives people just no reason not to get the pdf alongside the the print on demand is try as we might as publishers there's always a typo that slips through etc right so by giving them both for the same price they can always have that that latest and greatest pdf that doesn't have um any errata still in it so yeah, really cool. Let's let's go up here and look at a little bit more on this Cholt adventure um, with really fun artwork. I love this <laughs> sort of prehistoric look. It's so cool. It says, Cholt is a beautiful but dangerous place. People venturing through the jungle may be faced with huge reptilian creatures called dinosaurs, deadly plants, undead, yuanti, and much more. 
It's not a walk in the park. So there's 10 encounters just in this Chult section. How awesome is that? Um, each encounter listed in this product comes with a detailed explanation of how to run it in your campaign. Most of them are accompanied by detailed maps to enhance your experience. So CZRPG always has awesome maps. Um, you can you can get maps separately from them, I think. And then um, almost everything they produce has really good maps for you know VTT or whatever you want. Another reason, I think, to get um, digital and, and print on demand is so that you have both. Um, so that you get the zip file with the VTT files uh, with the digital. Uh, so it talks about the challenge. It says when the reward section of an encounter includes experience points reward, refer to the XP thresholds by character level table. Um, so then we've got encounters, T-Rex attack. So it's encounter level seven to eight. So it's a hard combat encounter. It's focused on combat instead of maybe um, social interaction or exploration. Um, it says the characters are drawn to a wild elf being attacked by a Tyrannosaurus Rex, but this is a ruse to lure characters into an ambush. The wild elf, Alistra Wilderthorn, is a druid and native to the jungles of Cholch, who resents the existence of Port Nianzaru and the outsiders despoiling the jungle. She has already lured several Flaming Fist patrols to their deaths and plans to add the characters to her list of victims. So, not a friendly wild elf. <laughs> um, so yeah, you're gonna have to deal with that. Um, I like that though. That's a cool name too, Alistra Wilderthorn. That's fun. Um, it says the encounter. The characters hear screams of terror through the jungle, high pitched and clearly female. Assuming they seek out the encounter, uh, the characters burst through the jungle undergrowth to see an elven woman floundering in a river, trying to escape a ferocious Tyrannosaurus Rex. Unless the characters are invisible, she looks directly at them and calls for help. The characters can see blood in the water, and she struggles to stand. Um, but she has three crocodile companions concealed in the waters of the river as well as four constrictor snakes. Yeah, so she's prepared to strike here. That's awesome. I love it because it's kind of a twist of like the damsel in distress, right? You think, oh, got to save this this character. And then it's like, no, not the best idea. <laughs> uh, so fun stuff. And then um, outcomes, this is if the party chooses not to investigate, they hear the commotion coming toward them and the encounter occurs anyway, just not at the river. So that's cool that, that the authors are really saying, hey, we get it. You got to let your players decide what happens. But if you want it to just happen anyway, it just, just move it over here, right? And just have them sort of step in it. Um, so I love that. I love that they're giving you the option. So the other one, it says, if they deliberately seek to evade the encounter, she lets them go, careful to not fully reveal herself, and plans another ambush for the future. This one, not using the damsel in distress routine, as her prey are clearly too callous for such a ploy to work. Um, it says, Alistra escapes to plague the characters once more and will return with other awakened and non-awakened beast companions, possibly tailored to the character's skills, such as pteranodons if the characters demonstrate the ability to fly, etc. Um, so that's that's one outcome. Another one is that her and her animal companions are slain, and then it's got a list of rewards. So very well organized, right? These are all the possible outcomes. The party can try to avoid it. Here's how to make them sort of have to encounter it. Uh, here's some options if, if it goes a different direction than you thought. Here's the possibilities if they do engage her. And then here's the rewards. Um, so it says they carry no treasure of worth, but she does have a crude map of Cholt. Um, and if the characters slay a list or award them XP for a deadly encounter, if she survives but is forced to retreat, they should receive XP for a hard encounter. So again giving you everything you need for the encounter. And that's just the first one, the first one in this book. Remember, each one of these sections has a significant number of encounters. So um, very, very cool. And Alistra is uh, CR7. So fun, fun stuff. And then you get into Message in a Bottle, which is a CR3 combat counter if, if provoked. Um, it talks about the outcomes and the rewards. I mean such a variety and diversity of encounters for all over the forgotten realms i mean anywhere you want to go 
there's going to be adventures in here for you to get you there, if nothing else. So uh, I think you can't go wrong with this one. As I said, these are rare. There's only 50 some hardcovers on DMs Guild. So, you know, it's, it's a good collection to have. And um, as I said, you can get both the digital and the hardcover. And uh, I really recommend that because it's the same price. Um, if you're investing in the hardcover, might as well get that digital. You get those VTT files and you can have this beautiful book on your bookshelf and support all these creators. There's a bunch of creators involved in this one. Um, it's already a best copper seller, so it sold over 51 copies in its first week. So check it out. It's under Encounters in the Forgotten Realms in the links below. Give it a click. Next we have Glyph Enchantment by Eric Rise. And I absolutely love this cover. I think it's so beautiful. Um, I know it's 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 more abstract, but I just it just looks really cool. I love the the design of it, the colors of it, and um, I think it's it's smart for a series like this that's focused on um, the different schools of magic to have um, that kind of feeling to it. So very very cool. Um, and it says, level up your enchantment spells with more than 90 new magical glyphs. So we've talked about this series before for some of the previous schools of magic. And I just find it to be so awesome. I've actually purchased all of, you know, almost all of the ones in the series um, myself because I just I just find them fun and, and interesting to read through. And, and, and they spark my imagination. And um, it's really cool because you can you can basically take spells that people have known forever and you can add this element of a glyph, which is either, you know, you, you base a glyph is like a symbol, right? So you would maybe draw a symbol or you'd you motion through the air to create this symbol, whatever it is, whatever the glyph that you're creating is. And in so doing, you're going to cause these spells to behave differently, whether they're going to be more powerful or they're going to do something slightly different than you're used to whatever it is it's a way to take some of these spells that you've just gotten sick of <laughs> you know and make them interesting and different and um unexpected and I, i've said this on all the ones we've looked at i think you know think about npcs think about villains because as the DM, you're going to be in charge of how these glyphs roll out. Is this something that is just automatic? You pick a spell like Friends and you have access to Glyph of the Backstabber and Glyph of Best Friends? Or do you say, okay, yes, you have access to Glyph of the Backstabber if you take the Friends spell. But Glyph of the Best Friends, you have to do this adventure, this encounter. You have to meet this person to learn the glyph that you need to draw with your finger or whatever in the air um, to do it. Or... Do you give Glyph of the Best Friends to just NPCs or to villains, right? So you have all this flexible options. And I've even said, you know, you can turn some of these into magic items. Um, so I love this. You know, it's only $3.95 for this. And you get just page after page of different things you can do with spells. Um, so, and again, it's part of this beautiful series. I mean, look at these covers. Um, and there's a bundle down here if you scroll down to get um, the first ones. Um, don't mind the price. I've already, you know, gotten all of these, so it shows zero for me. Um, but that's because I already own it. Um, so anyway, let's look inside. So you get that intro it helps explain what glyphs are and how to work them. You know, a lot of stuff like this where it's like a, a new thing, like new optional rules or whatever. They they can be tedious. They can be clunky. This one, it seems really easy to implement um, because it's just simple. It's so simple. And, and, and to me, sometimes simple is the best because you don't really have to do much other than have this book. And, you know, maybe you, you copy paste, you go, OK, here you copy this and you email it to a player or you or you show it on screen or you print it or whatever. And, and um, off you go. It's not. It's not like all these extra rolls you have to do. It's not all this crunching you got to do. It's just, here you go. Here's this Here's this glyph. Um, and what I think could be really fun is if you're an artist or you want to doodle or you have a player that likes to doodle, 
they could come up with the actual symbols. I mean, why not? That could be really fun. Um, maybe it's an elven, right? You just you could use elven characters or you could use riffs on those, right? So uh, I think it could be, especially if you have, maybe you have an artistic player that you feel like is not engaged enough in the, in the table. So maybe by getting them to create some artwork or something will help tie them to what they're doing more and maybe they can each time they go to do um a spell they show their their artwork and so everybody goes "Ooh, oh, look at that whoa right you know and so they're more focused they're more they're paying attention or maybe you have an artist friend you've been trying to get to play um dungeons and dragons and so that that would be a way to draw them in as well say so, hey i need you to draw some glyphs for me um but let's just kind of scroll through and look at some of the fun different options. So you've got um, Hex here. So Hex is a well-known spell. It says Glyph of Hexnot. Um, the damage dice of Hex increases to 1d8, but the range is reduced to 30 feet, and the spell ends if you end your turn more than 30 feet away from the target. So also smartly balancing Eric is you know giving you something but taking something away like reducing that that range so that it doesn't break your game um, and another one is glyph of malleable curses while concentrating on hex you can use a bonus action to give disadvantage to a different ability but you can no longer move the spell to a new creature if the original target drops to zero hit points so again a give and take so smartly balancing this so that it's not like oh my gosh i use these glyphs and it broke my game um, and some of them even have three. So we've got command over here with three options. And there's also spells from from uh, outside the player's handbook, like Silvery Barbs here from, from Strixhaven. Um, so let's read one of those. Glyph of Encouragement Silvery Barbs can now be used when a friendly creature you can see within 60 feet of yourself fails on an attack roll, an ability check, or a saving throw. The triggering creature can re-roll the d20 and use the higher roll. Record the number of the highest roll. For one minute, you can replace any attack roll, saving throw, or ability check made by you with the recorded roll. You must choose to do so before the roll. When used this way, the other effects of Silvery Barbs are not applied. So, you know, people have issues with Silvery Barbs. Um, you could change the spell to do one of these things. Just not even have the glyph. So, you see the versatility of the glyphs. They can be whatever you want because they are brilliantly simple. So, as I said, I encourage you to get this, get get the whole series, play with it. Um, you know, it's really up to you how you want to work this in. Even if you just, um, you know, like I said, have it be something that's that's legendary that they have to go on a quest to get these glyphs. You know, maybe they start off with calm emotions, but over time they unlock something to get the glyph of animosity I and mean, that can be really fun to look for especially if you have players that are maybe um, not as engaged as you want this can be a way to bring them in because you can have them look through the glyphs pick the glyphs i mean there's a lot of ways to bring them in and there's that whole bundle as well so i'm all about these glyphs look for it in the video description links it's under glyph enchantment give it a click Next, we have Halflings and Hops, Gazetteer of Lurin uh, for Forgotten Realms. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, but I'm not sure how to say it. Um, but it's an ultimate guide to the world of Halflings and their culture in Lurin. And it's 71 pages for $7.99. And it gives you a comprehensive overview of the Halfling Society and their way of life, as well as countless NPCs, plot hooks, and adventure ideas that can be used with any role-playing system. Explore the pastoral beauty of halfling communities, savor the rich flavor of their beers, and delve into the legends and tales passed down through generations. The high-resolution and highly detailed regional and local maps will transport you to the heart of Lurin, Willen Nook Village, where adventure and excitement await. The book also includes information on various factions, such as the March Wardens, the Harpers, and the Henfist. It also details secret organizations like the Zentarum and the Black Blood Clan. So there's just all sorts of stuff in here. Um, and you can see it looks really cool in terms of layout. Unfortunately, right now, the full-size preview is giving an error. So we're going to zoom in on this. Um, it's also by Ken Usman and Stormcrow Dreamscapes. Um, 
So yeah, we'll zoom in here and and see what we can we can read for you. Uh, oh, Lazy Cat Inn. That looks like a fun fun little section to read. Um, we've got a Lara Dawn Strike. That's a cool name. Uh, oh, adventure backgrounds. Okay, so you, it gives you some some ideas for using those. Adventure lust. Cool. Let's zoom in more. Um, your family was well respected, and your upbringing was surrounded by comfort. But something stirred within you—a yearning for adventure and curiosity about the world beyond your hometown. One day, you stumbled upon an ancient tome in the library that spoke of far-off lands and mythical creatures. From that moment, your desire for adventure grew, and you began to seek out any knowledge or stories about distant lands. So, despite your family's objections, you left behind a life of comfort and set out to explore the world and fulfill your thirst for adventure. Um, so, it's, it gives you common origins of where they might be from, and then suggested callings. Um, so, skills would be... Um, investigation survival tool proficiencies all that good stuff and then it says your feature is you have a vast network of adventure contacts both current and retired who are always eager to share their knowledge and experiences with you you are able to gather valuable information on potential quests including hidden treasures and dangerous locations from other adventurers your reputation as a trustworthy and reliable adventurer also precedes you and many races are more likely to open up to you and welcome you into their communities so that's nice um, I like that, you know, a network of adventurers can really come in handy, um, you know, if that's what you're up to, is adventuring. You never know when you're going to need uh, the cavalry. Um, and then you've got these spark of adventure, so your faithful event, it says, a band of dwarves seeking revenge against an evil dragon requested my assistance, and I couldn't refuse the challenge. So maybe that's how you started your adventuring career. Um, another characteristic personality trait says, I always announce my catchphrase before entering dungeons. It's become a ritual for me. It brings me luck. Um, so that could be a fun thing to roleplay. And I'm just reading one, right? There's a table of six of, of, of those and eight of the, the personality traits. So um, you should check those out. So again, love these names. Heinrich Felix and Alara Donstrike. Uh, but let's look at the Lazy Cat Inn. The Lazy Cat Inn is a cozy establishment a little bit north of the Trader's Way, making it the perfect place for travelers venturing on the Trader's Way to rest their weary heads before leaving or entering Willow Nook. It's also popular among the students of Ulnikin School, um, as many of them sneak away from their dorms at night to indulge in a pint or two at the inn. Local halflings also frequent the inn, making it a hub of activity and gossip. So, sounds like a perfect uh, place to begin an adventure. It says, Toblin Redfoot, a halfling from Willanook, runs the inn with the help of his brother Eckberth, a master crossbow sharpshooter and skilled tracker. The Redfoot brothers ensure that the inn is always safe and secure place for their guests, providing comfort and security. So, cool, you get the inn keepers' names, uh, kind of what their, their, their angle is as far as, you know, they want everybody to be safe. Um... And then it's getting into some sort of adventure hooks here because it says it was recently visited by a mysterious and alluring female elf who goes by the name of Ravenna. She claims to be a retired adventurer, but many suspect there's more to her story than meets the eye. Despite her mysterious past, Ravenna has taken up residence at the inn and now offers private lessons in thievery. So that could be really fun too. You know, coming up with ways to to explain the leveling process is is a, i think a fun challenge because you could just say oh okay you did great you know you somehow learn this stuff and not even talk about it and you know the next session you have these new abilities and there's no explanation or you could have an npc and you could say you know during your downtime between sessions you know come up with you know what did you do if you're a rogue you know did you meet with ravenna and you know, how did that go? Let's, you know, give me just a couple minute description of that for everybody at the table to, to hear about your downtime. And I think that's fun. I mean, it makes you closer to the character, gives you some more autonomy as a player to be able to um, uh, explain kind of what happened in your downtime from your point of view. So yeah, this looks, this looks really fun. I think, um, Gives you a lot of details. You, you know, halflings really aren't given that much focus. So it's nice to have a 71-page book <laughs> devoted to them uh, for 5th edition. So look for it in the links below under Halflings and Hops and give it a click. 
Next, we have literary villains from Tom Flynn. Suggest a price of $3 for 51 pages. And um, it is a manual of villains from literature, their minions, and their lairs. And it says classic literature and fiction has always been a source of inspiration for role-playing game enthusiasts. For decades, the creators of role-playing games have incorporated various literary characters and settings into their games, from King Arthur to Grey Mouser, you know, wh whoever it is. Uh, these characters are finding their way into our games. And so this uh, particular title is going to give you 51 pages for a suggested price, which is a steal in my eyes. Um, you've got, I mean, so many characters in here. The Wicked Witch, uh, Captain James Hook, Sweeney Todd, the Queen of Hearts. I mean, it, it really goes through a lot of famous, well-known, you know, public domain characters, because of course these have to be ones that, you know, are not copyrighted. Um, and, uh, it's great because I mean you can definitely use those like the Wicked Witch from Wizard of Oz is here um, and uh, I think that could be really fun to to experience that as a player even if um, you know it can be it could be something random like you know a spell goes awry and, and the Wicked Witch shows up from Oz you know in the Forgotten Realms right like it doesn't have to be that you have to build a whole Oz campaign you could you certainly could but it could be that magic causes this this character to show up or they step through a portal or you step through a portal or or whatever it is and then they're there and then that's the encounter or maybe you have some sort of dimensional hub like the radiant citadel where you're going through different things you know planescape is coming so people are going to be coming and going across worlds or spell jammer you could take spell jammer um, you know, a spell jammer from whatever campaign setting to Oz. Maybe Oz has, there's an Oz space out there. So, fun, fun stuff. And, um, you know, there's even Winged Monkey uh, stat blocks in here. Um, but it, I like it. It's a very clean layout. There's even, it looks like some maps. And then you've got um, James Moriarty from, you know, Sherlock Holmes. Uh, stuff so that that could be really good too to to go up against a mastermind um, so let me go back up here and read just a little bit about the wicked witch it says the wicked witch of the west character was created by l frank Baum and appears in several of his books um and she's portrayed as the main antagonist in these books and is known for her evil nature and magical powers. In Baum's books, the Wicked Witch of the West is described as an old and ugly woman with green skin, a hooked nose, and long gray hair. She is the ruler of the Winky Country or country in the West of Oz and is feared by all who know her. The Wicked Witch is known for her use of dark magic and is portrayed as a powerful and dangerous foe to the story's heroes. So we all know, you know, the Wicked Witch, right? And there's, you know, the musical Wicked and, you know, all sorts of ways that you can go about portraying this character. It says, um, she's been adapted to numerous movies, television shows, stage productions, and her portrayal has varied across different mediums. Um, so, you know, you got Margaret Hamilton's portrayal in the 1939 film. I always, always thinking about that movie, it just astonishes me that it was 1939 that they made such a cool looking movie in that that time period because you know there was no cgi <laughs> um it's an interesting year for films because i think gone with the wind came out that year as well anyway i could talk about that all day but the wicked witch is uh yeah fun character you can play her as more like the wicked version or you could play her more as the the uh, 1939 film version and you can have fun with that you can say like oh you know my reputation precedes me and you know um you could or you could go against what the reputation is maybe have her be the the victim in the story right and then later she turns on the party or or if they cross her they turn you know she thinks they crossed them her she she turns on them or whatever right um and it says uh you know you're getting a lot of history here which i appreciate and then you get the stat block of course and then all the minions 
but it says she's a beautiful fake creature but with an oppressive and malevolent presence lurking within her crackling her cackling voice echoes sending chills down one's spine she's a formidable foe with powerful dark magic at her disposal she's fiercely protective of her territory and will stop at nothing to keep her power in control she has a loyal family of flying monkeys at her disposal ready to do her bidding her dark magic can manifest in a variety of ways from turning herself invisible to ma manipulating fire Adventurers will need to use all their wits and abilities to overcome her power and defeat her minions. She is a master of deception and manipulation and may try to make alliances to further her own goals. So you could have her even morphing from, you know, the Wicked version to the 1939 film version or your own creation, whatever your imagination, right? Um, so I love this. I mean, we just barely scratched the surface. There's this, you can all read about Moriarty, um, and you know from the sir arthur conan doyle stories uh sherlock holmes i mean this is this is the arch nemesis of sherlock holmes so i encourage you to read it and i mean it's a, it's a pay what you want so you can download the whole book for free then come back and pay definitely pay something got to support these creators i can't believe you know this 51 book page book is is uh pay what you want that's that's a steal um so you should check it out it's under literary villains in the links below give it a click Next, we have Nardine's Guide to Great Personality from Martine DeVico, and it's four ninety five for 15 pages. It says, has a character ever stuck with you way after the story is over? Maybe you read a book or saw a movie, and for some reason, one of the characters just stayed with you. You start to see them in other places and other characters even tying things together that have nothing to do with one another. You hear a song and can't help associate but associate it with them. You see a movie and what the protagonist does reminds you so much of that particular character. Perhaps it was what it was the story that did it for you. Maybe it was the actions they took, or it could have even been the way they were portrayed. But something really calls to you about the character. Um so it says, well, I know that you're probably not a stranger to this concept, but tabletop role-playing games bring the incredible opportunity of taking those characters and becoming them in one way or another. The agency provided to us as co-authors and audience of our own story is unique to these spaces. It gives us the possibility to experience these stories as whoever we wish to be. Whether we decided to be a direct representation of an existing character, someone inspired by them, or a creation of our own, the choice is entirely up to us and is truly magical. So this supplement is all about character creation. It aims to recreate what makes those characters click and helps you translate that into your own. It's not a guide to which spells to choose, your weapon options, or what class is best, but rather it's about what makes a character a character. Um, those distinct feature, features that make you go, oh yeah, just like so-and-so. Um, so this is, this is great because there are people that are new to D, D. there are people that are experienced with D, D, and maybe they just haven't had the best experience creating their character initially and they're watching other people do it and they're going oh, man i wish i could have a character that exciting or or maybe they've um been nervous maybe they're introverted and they they just kind of slowly develop their character because it's just so foreign to them um and whereas maybe it's natural to others so i think books like this where you're getting options to really um help you get through explaining your backstory and, and all these things is going to be really cool and there's a whole it looks like there's a whole um bundle down here with other um options from martine so uh you'll want to check that out as well you can get to it through our link uh, but let's look inside so it goes right into the identity um, through experiences we're going to talk about read through that in a second but look at all these tables to help you figure out what you're up to you know so it says shame motivated goal so it's a d4 you roll it the only way to prevent people from finding out is to be involved as possible so here i am in the thick of things so this character has some reason to feel ashamed and this character feels like the best way to keep that a secret is to get in the middle of a bunch of other things and distract everybody from thinking about it or, or asking about it, right? Um, and so, or maybe it's just for them to be distracted from it, 
right? Maybe the, it's, the shame is so painful that they need a distraction to, so that they don't think about it. Whatever it is, right? It's your world. Your 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 Bob Ross painting of uh, what your character is going to be. But you see, already we've got three, four options from just reading one thing on the shame motivated goal table. There's four options on that table and then there's a bunch of other ones relief motivated goals confusion motivated goals um but and and then you start up here with da to figure out like what is your your overall motivation is how do you feel about that event and how does it inform your goals because you have to first pick some events in your life right life defining events so this is going to walk you through some stuff so let's walk through one um there's a lot to read here i want you to read this because i think it's also really informative as well um, but it start, we'll start with your origins. We're just going to roll a one on all these so we can just kind of experience it. Um, so it says, a devoted servant to a deity in a large temple. It says, who were you before your life drastically changed? So our character was a devoted servant to a deity in a large temple. Then what caused that change in your life? What made you become an adventurer? So the very first one, someone I was close to died. So... You were a servant to a deity in a temple, and then someone close to you died. And then it says, well, what is your, your motivation? And so, again, we're rolling a one on all these, but there's plenty of options. First one is anger, so looking for retribution. It says, what do you intend to do about it? So if anger is your motivated goal, again, we're going to roll a one. I can't get my life back, but I sure as hell can make someone pay for what was done to me in an eye for an eye, as someone would say. So already we have this character they were in a temple that that's where they thought they were going to stay and then someone close to them died and now they're motivated by getting revenge and that's how they're thrust into this adventure so very straightforward very easy to build upon that once you've got all that then you can start saying well what was the deity's name and and where was the temple and who was the person that died and what was my relationship to them so you see all these questions you just start snowballing and answering and before you know it you know your snowball is this giant <laughs> boulder at the bottom of the mountain because you've just been um, you know, going with it, and you've got this huge backstory, and your DM's like, "Wow, I, I don't know if I can use all that. That's a lot, but it'll come out as as you know as you play, right?" Um, but that's how this book works, and we just we just rolled a one, right? Imagine if you're actually rolling and getting all the numbers. You know, there's so many. There's 20 options on these first two tables, so the the combinations are endless and we're just scratching the surface this is only you know the beginning there's so many things this is it says what qualifiers would you use to describe yourself what do you value above other things i'm i'm certain that if you go through this book with rolling on all these tables and you write down and track your answers and start fleshing out some of the specifics you are going to have a really robust character now the only thing i would say is don't get 100% attached to everything. When you when you do this kind of exercise, the story may go in a different direction. And so sometimes there are going to be parts of your backstory that you may need to just jettison and and replace with something else that makes more sense. And and that's safe to do if you haven't shared it, right? Like if you've just kept all this to yourself and you you're you're revealing little pieces as the story goes along, right? And so maybe, you know, you picked a deity and as you're going along, it just doesn't fit with the story or maybe there is another deity in the story and so maybe that would work better right and, so, and maybe you haven't said anything about it in, in your first session and so you talk to the dm and you say you know i have this backstory can i change the deity to this or whatever so i think as long as you're you're flexible with whatever story you come up with you're gonna have a lot of fun i really love this you know for 4.95 to be able to really just go step by step and flesh it out i think you're gonna have a really cool and fun time with this so look for it under nerdine's guide to great personality in the links below and give it a click next we have the spellborn race from daryl dominguez $1.95 for uh six pages and it says our magical potential is nothing but a speck of dust compared to mistra's these are her children 
And that's a quote from Darius Stanton in this book. It says, anyone across Faerun can manipulate and bend magic to their will with enough time and intelligence. There are those who must study all their life to accomplish this feat, and there are those who are born with enough power in their bloodline that they can reshape the weave with their will. Amongst this latter group is a rather small third contingent born from the weave itself who can manipulate the weave with unparalleled ease and accuracy known as spellborn. So you get two races, five racial feats, three spells, and two monster templates. So that's a good assortment of things for, for only $2. I, I love the price on this. Um, let's look inside. And Daryl always does really great layouts. I mean, look at this. This looks so nice. Um, easy to read. Nice artwork. Um, so anyway, you've got you've got your beautiful cover, of course. And then your, your background... It talks about creating your character, you know, your language, your lifespan, your height, your weight, all that stuff. So you have something called the Weaveborn, which is one of the races, it looks like. Um, so you have magical intuition. Whenever you make an arcana check related to the weave or spellcasting, you can roll a d6 and add the number rolled to the ability check. That's That'll come in handy. Um, innate magic. Whenever you finish a long rest, you choose from the list below. One cantrip at first level. In addition, as your level increases, you gain additional access to additional spells. So... There's this list of stuff that adds to your spell list, so that's cool. That's really helpful as a race uh, to get to get extra spells. Um, and then there's another race called the Spell Scarred. It says um, you have a variety of abilities as a result of unnatural connection to the Spell Plague. So I like how this ties into the lore of the Forgotten Realms too, like the Spell Plague. Um, so as a bonus action, you can summon the Arcane Flames of the Spell Plague to do one of the options below. Um, so you can step into the fires of the spell plague to teleport up to 20 feet. Um, or for the next one minute, you can deal extra fire damage to one target. So that could be helpful. Um, yeah, I like that fun stuff. And then feats for the races, which is so nice. And, and there's one that's for both of them. It says your innate magic, uh, allows you to manipulate the weave, protecting you from harm. You have advantage on saving throws against spells and other magical effects. So that, that would definitely come in handy. Um, and there's other ones, too, that are for specific races only, but quite a few. I uh, Yeah, really nice assortment, five different race, uh, racial uh, feats. And then you got some spells. And then just unbelievably helpful monster templates. I mean, to be able to throw these on existing creatures. I love templates. I wish they were more widely done in 5th edition because you can just take a monster and tweak it with the template. You just add these abilities, right? And it tells you how to figure out, um, you know, what what happens after you add it. But here's a weave born veteran where they've added some of the the things to it. So it's like a sample sample um, template use, which is again helpful because now you've got this CR three stat block for a weave born veteran that you can use. So packed full of stuff as usual from Daryl. Um, so these spells. Let's look at these. Um, I want to pick one because we're only going to read one. Um, it's hard to choose here, but uh, let's go with the first one. The Silver, fi Silver Fire Blast, 6th level. It's an action, self in a 70-foot line, instantaneous. You unleash a beam of whitish magical flame known as Silver Fire. This beam forms a line 70 feet long and 5 feet wide, originating from you in a direction you choose. Each creature in the line must make a dex saving throw. On a failure, the creatures are dealt 10d10 force damage and half as much on a successful saving throw. Walls and any objects that aren't being worn or carried in the spell's area also take the damage. An affected creature, everything it's wearing except magical items, a wall, or an object that isn't being worn or carried is reduced to a pile of fine gray dust if this damage reduces it to zero hit points. The creature can be restored to life only by means of a true resurrection or wish spell. So yeah, this is going to be a brutal <laughs> amount of damage in this line. Uh, and then you can increase it even more at 7th and uh, beyond so fun stuff yep lots of stuff from daryl that's really cool so uh, you got to check this out it's under spellborn race in the links below be sure to give it a click and check it out well that's our last new release i made it through being sick i still managed to get it done so i'm so happy uh you know i i, I just really want to make sure you guys uh, get to find out what's out there and not miss a week because um, I know a lot of people really enjoy this and um, 
it's some of the only promotions some of these books get so it's important to me to get it done um well thanks so much for watching please subscribe to the channel like the video for the algorithm leave us a comment and um you know share that video out there on your social media we need to get as many eyeballs on this as we can every week these the, you know these are small businesses that need your attention um so you can stay afloat so um you know share the video around um get get your friends to subscribe if you can and um to 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 look at the video because people don't realize how much great third-party content is out there um they don't realize they're even using it sometimes uh, or that their dm is using it so help educate them on that please and um look at those links in the video description click those um and support these creators through purchases um follow them on social media leave reviews comments etc help encourage them to keep going and if you purchase anything after you've clicked a link even if we didn't talk about it you're going to help this channel through a small affiliate fee so you know it's great if you can do your shopping with us whenever you're thinking about shopping on one of these sites first go to one of our videos and click a link and and there you go you're helping us and that's that's huge um keeps us going even when we're sick um and uh um you know if you really want to support us even more um we do have seven books including our platinum best-selling dragonlance companion um in the links below as well and you can go to splinterverse.com to learn about all of our books or join our mailing list, etc. We're working on a big Kickstarter. It's going to be massive, a massive book, one of the biggest books we've ever done over a year in the making. Um, so I cannot wait to start talking more about that later this year. And, uh, you know, if you're following us everywhere, you know, at Splinterverse, you'll, you'll, you'll know, um, you'll be the first to know what we're doing with that so you can you can follow along and, and get excited it's it's really hard to keep the cat in the bag on that one because it is it is something i've always wanted to share with you so i can't wait um if you're a creator watching you know i talked to you last week about deciding whether you just want to you know do this as a hobby do this as a side gig or a full-blown career so based on that you really need to um to strategize how you're going to release your books if, you, if you're just casual you know you can just throw your books up there with whatever amount of effort you want to put into it if you want it to be a part-time income stream or um even a full-time gig you really need to set aside a lot of time to make sure that your catalog pages on these sites is is the best it can be because that is really your entry point for your 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 people even me you know doing this video to to find out about your book and i know it's exhausting you you worked on the book you're you're, you're you have nothing left but you need to save some and, and 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 involve others to um help you craft that page to where people are going to be motivated to buy and to really find out i mean i've read some of these pages and not not in this episode but and you know when i'm going through and trying to pick because we don't cover every single new release we cover uh you know a curated list um sometimes i don't even know what the book is i don't know is it a, is it a adventure is it a class is it so I, I i can't even tell and sometimes it's just a wall of text so you gotta really really think about that if you want to succeed if you want to make money um it, you're going to have to craft your catalog pages to really tell a story tell people what it is and, and break it up break up that wall of text you know ask feedback you can you can create the page without launching it have people look at it write it on uh, you know in a word document and share it you know and you can build this catalog page as you go things that you put on your back cover can be repurposed things that you put in your introduction can be repurposed for your catalog page you don't have to do such a heavy lift to get it done but you really have to put time into it if you want to be successful or make it a business so that's my tip for you this week and i'll try to keep coming up with with more tips for you because i know uh, a lot of creators watch this as well and some of you that aren't probably find it interesting but anyway always happy to be here with you and um go on the ride through the the unexpected adventures and books that we find each week so thank you for joining me for that and supporting the channel and until next time happy adventuring <laughs>